Hi, I'm Mary Doherty. I live in Bayfield, which is very far from here. But I'm going to give you a little background about what we did in Bayfield and then figure out how possibly you could replicate that down here. And unfortunately, I printed my thing out with tiny words, so I'm probably going to I didn't know how to make it bigger. But anyway, so the deal, I got involved in this gig um, about, two, in 2015, we had a proposal for 26,000 hog CAFO seven miles from Lake Superior in Bayfield County. If we don't have any CAFOs in Bayfield County. We're really far north. It's not really the kind of place where you'd expect to see that massive um, agriculture, so we weren't really prepared for it. And we started a group called Farms on Factories and kind of sat down and thought, how does this, is this who we are in, in Bayfield County? How, what are we going to do about it? And we quickly, unfortunately, learned that you guys are under the same um, legislative scheme, is that we can't say no to a CAFO in Wisconsin. In 2006, Governor Doyle, a Democrat, took away the ability of local communities to control where these things are cited in their community with the passage of something called At Cap 51, uh, the livestock citing law. So, when we first heard that, obviously our, you know, little hopeful balloons of optimism kind of deflated because we were thinking, well, good Lord, what are we going to do about this? So we started, um, we started where all this stuff starts, which is you have to get out into your community. And I always say that this is a huge deal. What you guys are up against is nothing to sneeze at. You're up against an industry that has a tremendous amount of money. They have a tremendous amount of legislative influence. They have, frankly, been on the scene a little bit longer than we have as far as studying the stage so they can be as effective and you know, tend to their bottom line at the expense of citizens for quite some time. So I always suggest, I'm going to share with you what we did in Bayfield, but it's important to know that this sort of local control is firmly and completely rooted in the place where it is developed. So what we did in Bayfield may not work for you down here. I'm just going to share those examples with you. What I will tell you is that in order to get that sort of um, groundswell of support, that, that interaction with your local county boards and town boards, you have to ask your, your community three questions. Who are you in the Driftless? What do you guys value in the Driftless? And then how do you propose to protect that? It is extremely important that you don't go to question number three until you've done the work with questions one and two. A lot of what we see in this world of fighting against industry is that we are told you have to engage with the regulatory system. It's absolutely important that we continue to do that. But as citizens who are seeking remedy, how can we create a remedy that's resilient to our community if we don't know who we are and what we value? Because when you look at it, legislation, regulations, ordinances, they are simply just a formalization of a community's values. They're not something that's evil. They're not something that's bad. It's just a way for you all to say, this is what we are down here. This is what we value. And so we're going to put into writing and make some rules around the lay of the land in our community so you all know who we are down here. And so in Bayfield, this is where small writing is going to get to your problem. Um, we did, we, well, first off, we passed a year-long moratorium on CAFOs. And keep in mind, we were able to do this with the county board that was not favorable to us. The, um, the first vote failed. Second one went by, passed by two votes. So we were, thankfully were given a pause for a year. During that year, the county formed a livestock, um, a large-scale livestock study committee. And what that study committee did was um, research, analyze, and synthesized scientific literature regarding the impact of CAFOs on groundwater, surface water, air quality, and as specifically as those related to Bayfield County. So we had a year to kind of press the pause button and figure out what a CAFO was going to mean for us. As a result of that, um, the recommendations by that large-scale livestock study committee, we passed a manure management and storage ordinance in the watershed where the CAFO was to be cited. That got a little complicated because the way the laws are written is that local communities cannot pass more stringent standards as it relates to water quality without approval from the DNR. So we thought, okay, well, we'll ask for, we'll ask for approval. Here's all our science 
sure seems like it might be a good idea, and they said no. They said no because we don't currently have a CAFO in that watershed that is currently impaired. So in a nutshell, they said you can't regulate something that doesn't exist. It's kind of the gist of it in a very simple Twitter kind of way to explain that to you. Um, and then, <laughs> I don't think it's just many pages of, of their uh, rejection. But then, so Bayfield County appealed their rejection. And recently, a Bayfield County judge just issued his a decision and sent it back to the DNR. So it's that still being noodled out in the court systems in Wisconsin. On top of that, we drafted and passed a really precedent-setting uh, ordinance called an operations ordinance that recognizes state preemption over siting and water quality, but puts local decision-making authority in oper over operations in the hands of county supervisors. That operations ordinance has been passed in Douglas County as well. And what makes it kind of interesting is that it has a component, and keep in mind this hasn't been tested yet, so <coughs> we don't know what's gonna happen in the court system, I'm sure it will. But um, there is a, a condition that the CAFO applicant has to prove that a CAFO of similar, with similar characteristics has not caused private or public nuisance for 10 years. That was based on the mining moratorium prove it first clause that was recently overturned. Um, it also has a bonding component. So should the CAFO go belly up, the county has money to do with remediation and mitigating. Um, there is a component with the application process because the counties don't have any money. And so the last thing you wanna do to your county board members is say, hey, here's a whole other stack of work y'all gotta do. Don't you like being a volunteer? So as part of that application process, the applicant has to provide money or funds to, um, to adequately empower that county board to look at the ordinance. Like I said, that might not be what you all wanna do down here, that's just what we did up in Bayfield. We also passed a human health hazard, human health hazards ordinance that defines human health hazard as a substance, activity, or condition that is known to cause acute or chronic illness or death if exposure to the substance, activity, or condition is not abated. The ordinance's purpose and intent is to protect the public health and safety and general welfare and to maintain and protect the environment for the people of Bayfield County. So we did all of that basically with the county board that wasn't necessarily in our favor in the beginning, but the manure storage ordinance passed unanimously. The operations ordinance passed unanimously. And that following year in 2016, we had an unprecedented amount, seven candidates for county board, five of which were elected. And so now we have a county board that is much more amenable to listening to us as citizens and our values. I mean, county board supervisors are up this year down here for you guys too. And it is, I mean, if I had anything to recommend is, I don't know where you are in the process, but it sure doesn't hurt to ask the candidates, where do you stand on water quality? Where do you stand on drafting and passing legislation that protects your ability to help citizens have access to clean drinking water? I mean, those are really basic questions and I don't think that's necessarily a partisan or an issue that would cause division. We just need to know, can we turn on our tap and be safe that what we drink isn't gonna hurt us? It seems pretty simple, but it gets complicated when there's money involved. So, um, in, oh, in state, so part of the statewide coalition first, I'm the president of the Sustain Rural Wisconsin Network, which is the coalition of grassroots capo, which the forest mentioned earlier. We're calling for a statewide moratorium on new and expanding capo permits. <laughs> wrap it all up because I, every time I do these talks I think that sounds like pie in the sky. We know how on earth do we get from here to five years from now when maybe we make some progress. And there's a great um, a guy that I met, in, I've met a lot of really great people in Capo land and he has a saying that his name's Rick Young, he's from um, Toronto. He says, my point is that to give up hope is not just to d deny the possibilities of the future, it is also to deny the lessons of the past. The world can change and does change. And what seemed almost impossible looking forward can seem almost inevitable looking back. And how I frame that is, we're all old enough to remember the anti-smoking campaign. Do you think when that first group of citizens said, 
I don't want to breathe secondhand smoke. He got a standing ovation, but he or she? No way. I mean, he was up against a massive industry, an industry with a tremendous amount of influence. And today, we don't smoke in airplanes. We don't smoke in hospital rooms. And that was a statewide led. The ban on smoking isn't a federal ban. It's a ban at the state level. And so to wrap it up, I think if you care about this issue, absolutely do the work you need to do to engage. But also take a look at how can you build political power. And political power isn't necessarily just built by running for office. It's applying to be on a committee, a land and conservation committee, health committee, zoning committee. Find ways to put your voices into that system and start voicing your concerns. Because when people hear that, then they come on board. Now I'm, I'm sure I'm done. But, so I'm doing over there is I'm going to plug my Words for Water project. So I've, I brought my chalkboards down today. You can go over near where it says the world's thirsty for water. And it's a project that has a simple premise. If you could speak for water, what would you say? You all write it on a chalkboard. I take your picture. And what we're doing with this project is formalizing our values into a collective story about who you guys are in the Driftless when it comes to water. And as we collect all these words, we're going to see, I have seen a tremendous amount of continuity. And we take this connective story, collective story that we're building, mm -hmm. and we ask our elected officials, why are our values not being represented? Because again, legislation is just the codification of our values. So if we have values that say we think water is life, we think it's a right, we think it's necessary, it's got to be in the legislation. So if you want to have your picture taken, come on over. <laughs>